I am really delighted to welcome you all to this webinar, which is part of the 2020 ESB IIEA series entitled Rethink Energy. I'd like to thank the ESB for their sponsorship of this event. We are delighted to be joined today by Eamon Ryan, TD, Minister for the Environment, Climate and Communications. I'd like to, to thank him particularly for being so generous with his time to speak with us today. Eamon Ryan's uh, portfolio includes climate action, communications network and transport. He was appointed to this role in June. Um, he's leader of the Green Party, a position he's held since May 2011. He has been a TD for Dublin Bay South since 2016, and he previously served as a TD for Dublin South from 2002 to 2011. He was the founding chairperson of the Dublin Cycling Campaign, and he began his political career as a Dublin City Councillor. He then went, to, went on to serve as Minister for Communications, Energy and Natural Resources from 2007 to 2011. The title of the Minister's address is The European Green Deal, Future Proofing Energy in Ireland. He will speak to us for roughly 20 minutes or so, and after his presentation, we will go to a question and answers session <laughs> with you, our audience. <clears throat> Excuse me. You will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see towards the bottom of your screen. Um, I'd like you to feel free to send questions in throughout the session as they occur to you. Um, and I'd suggest that it would be very helpful if you'd identify yourself and any affiliation when you ask a question. And a reminder that today's presentation and questions and answer session are on the record. Um, you may also feel free to join the uh, discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. Before we proceed with the Minister's address, I would like to ask Pat O'Doherty, Chief Executive of the ESB, to offer some introductory remarks. Um, Pat will be, I gather, available to answer questions uh, during the Q&A session as well. Thanks very much. Over to you, Pat. Uh, thank you, Owen, and good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to welcome everybody here on behalf of ESB for the sixth and final lecture in our 2020 Rethink Energy series in partnership with the IIEA. Over the past six months, we've heard from leading Irish and international experts on various aspects of the energy transition. So it's entirely appropriate and timely that the final lecture this year will be given by Minister Raymond Ryan, whose drive to transform Ireland's energy sector will have a lasting impact uh, on future generations. Today's topic, which looks at the Irish energy sector in the context of the European Green Deal, this has implications to stretch well beyond the energy sector. So I'm delighted that we have such a large and very diverse audience here today to join us. The Green Deal expresses the shared ambition of European member states to transition to net zero by 2050. And it sets out a roadmap and a policy agenda for delivering on these key commitments. It touches on many areas of policy, uh, but electricity will inevitably take center stage given its capacity to drive carbon reduction in other sectors of the economy, particularly in transport and in heat. Uh, I, I'm president of Euroelectric and in that role, I have the privilege of engaging with and representing electricity utilities across all of Europe, of course, including ESB. And importantly, Euroelectric members have just recently put their weight behind the EU Green Deal and have expressed support for the revised emissions reduction target of 55% by 2030. And this is, this is a big deal. This is a big deal for the electricity sector. And it's a significant endorsement from the sector, particularly when you consider that many Euroelectric members are from countries that still have very, very high levels of coal in their energy mix. And over the past decade, the electricity sector has demonstrated its ability to innovate and to implement changes to reduce carbon emissions, but while also maintaining a secure, affordable electricity supplies. And of course, we come to appreciate this during the COVID pandemic. Two thirds of electricity generated across the EU in the first half of this year is carbon free and 40% of that has come from renewable sources. But you know, much, much more needs to be done. And the European Commission recently published its energy systems integration strategy. And this highlights the need to accommodate very large new loads onto the electricity distribution system to enable more renewable energy to come on stream, but also to support electrification of transport and heat and industry. 
It also highlights the need to embrace digital, digital technology to enhance the role of the electricity network, particularly in, facil in facilitating this transition. In Ireland, we're already taking steps to deliver on both objectives in order to meet the targets set out in the programme for government and in the Climate Action Plan. But this requires broad stakeholder alignment across finance, across regulation, technology and policy to ensure that the necessary investments are made in a timely way to maximise the use of clean electricity in the final energy demand. Across ESB, we're committed to collaborating with our industry partners uh, to support government targets and agree deal. Uh, it won't be without some pain. This year, we will close uh, our peat stations. Uh, and today, actually, is the last day for West Offaly Power, one of our peat stations that have come off load for the last time uh, this afternoon and Offaly Power in a week's time. And our peat stations and the, the, the collaboration between ESB and Board of Mona have delivered secure electricity supplies and created employment in the Midlands for decades. But, you know, along with the growth of our renewable portfolio and especially uh, new investments in offshore wind, this brings us another step closer to our vision for a low carbon energy system powered by clean electricity. We're innovating right across all of our business to make this a reality. And while the changes in, in how we generate and distribute electricity are both critical, but ultimately it's the role that the customers will play. And I know the minister has a very, very keen interest in what he calls the role of the citizen. And, the role, and this role cannot be overstated. It will be their willingness to make low carbon choices to adopt new technologies such as EVs, heat pumps, smart meter, to retrofit their homes. And this ultimately will determine the pace of the change. Uh, we're working to develop insights in ESB to, to look at how we can use insights to define and design products and services to engage customers in this energy transition, regardless of whether their motivation is climate action or indeed affordability. I'm conscious that much of this is going to be influenced by our economic recovery and investment plans over the coming years, uh, which will in turn be shaped by the European Green Deal. I'm looking forward to hearing you, Minister, as we all are, and to hear your perspective on this and the implications that you see for Ireland's energy sector over the period ahead. Thank you very much. And I will now hand over to Minister. Pat, thank you very much indeed. And thank you, Owen. Um, can I start maybe, Owen, I need to add one thing. You mentioned a list of things I've done over the years. One of the things I'm proudest of was I co-chaired the Digital Policy Group in the Institute of International and European Affairs and was also very involved in the Climate and Energy Group. And I mentioned that because, proud because I was proud to work with Brendan Halligan. Um, I miss him. I miss Brendan Halligan. I'm sure a lot of people watching this know that feeling this year. We lost him in August and didn't lose him, gone to higher things, but um, he was a real mentor to me. Uh, an inspiration, a joy to be with. Um, and when it comes to energizing Ireland's future, I think actually he has, he will, history will see that he had a critical role. It will be uh, his thinking, I think, has been picked up by a lot of people and shared, including myself. So what I say today is in memory of Brendan Halligan. It's, it's, it, I'm, I'm repeating his words, I'm plagiarizing. And I'm remembering you'd meet him on a Monday for lunch to discuss grid networks. And with Twinkle and I, of course, you'd have a glass of wine to, to discuss it. And everyone would know, who, who know Brendan, the sweep of time and place. It was like playing on the risk board with Brendan. You know, you, you, one minute you'd be in China, the next minute you'd be with Daniel O'Connell and, and thinking of that role, Pat, of the citizen in in an O'Connell-like way. That's where we constitute. And it wasn't just US, it was European and international, but he was South Dublin to his core. That's maybe why I liked him, a South Dublin boy, but he was Rathfarnham, UCD School of Philosophy, good crack, intelligent, breadth of, of interests. And that's, I just wanted to start by my comments by referring to him. I'm not just referring to him, but it developed some of his thinking as he shared it with me. He said two things maybe I could pick up on, on terms of this topic of energizing Ireland's future. It's a simple thought. He says, we have access to wind power in this country that is akin to the competitive advantage we had in grass growing, which led to the development of an entire food industry here over the last 30 to 40 years. And I know it's obvious, and I know it's, but it's, it's sometimes the obvious needs to be restated. The, the, that basic comparison competitive advantage we have, we're in the windiest place on the planet, uh, and let's turn it into a, a use something that's useful for our citizens, bears repeating and drives everything that we should do. 
Um, second, I remember I met him for uh, about a year or two ago, and he was telling me about thinking about big about the state. You know, quite, when is Ireland good at things? What, how are we doing? And he cited, and only Brendan would have known this sort of detail, going back, I think, in the early mid 90s, the European Commission had looked to see why had Ireland done, done relatively well as a new member state to other countries. I suppose they were interested with regard to the expansion of the European Union to maybe see lessons for the new 10 accession countries. Well, take a country that had joined 20 or 30 years previously and look to see how did they make a success of it. And their sense was that Ireland had made a success. And I think they sent, according to Brendan, Jacques Delors to do that task. And Jacques Delors reported back to the European Commission that one of the reasons why Ireland's been so successful is that for a period from the late 50s, early 60s through to the 80s, uh, it had common cause in the project of making our European Union accession a success. And not just that, but common cause around the strategic objective that the state had, which over that 30 years, he argues, was going from being a closed economy to being an open economy. And that in the in the in the political stability or consensus around that, it allowed us to invest in education, to join the European Union, to uh, be good at foreign direct investment, and to make a success of it. So putting those two together, the big strategic sense of where we're going with energizing uh, our country, we have to think of our that the, the direction we're going is this 100% renewable future, and it is will work best when we devise that under a form of politics, or not just politics, but civil and, and political support for the project on a stable basis for two to three decades. That we, so if we, over the next two to three decades, set ourselves in this task of decarbonizing our electricity system and getting advantage from that, not just from the big global environmental perspective, but more broadly, that is what we should do. Thirdly, referring back to Brendan, I was working with him um, 12 years ago when I was then Minister of Energy uh, with the likes of Brian Hurley, Eddie O'Connor, obviously. There were a number of people who were thinking of this concept of a supergrid, of actually developing particularly offshore wind and interconnecting that wind, not just on the, with the island, but with our neighbouring island and the neighbouring continent. This big project, this big idea of the supergrid is something that Brendan also championed from the very start along with the likes of Eddie and Brian and others. And that was very much behind the North Sea's Offshore Grid Initiative, which was signed by 10 European countries 10 years ago. And I want to come back to today as the first point I want to make in terms of our, our energy future. Because if you look at what the government plans are, and the real confidence that I hope I can give Pat and others behind this plan, is that this is agreed across the political spectrum. This is something that all parties in the outgoing Oireachtas, and I believe this Oireachtas, have signed up to, yeah, we're going to go at least 70% renewable in 2030. Yeah, we're going to build something like 35 gigawatts of offshore wind. And given that our peak load at the moment is probably about 5 gigawatts of demand, like 35 gigawatts gives people a sense of how ambitious that is in scale. Um, and, that, that, that this supergrid project is going to be central to the energizing of our future, to providing a scale of electricity that taps into that basic concept Brendan had, turn, turn our comparative competitive advantage in wind, and particularly recognizing that our sea area being 10 times our land area, and that there are limits on the land area for good planning reasons, it is offshore wind that we can turn to for scale in energizing our future. Where are we at that? Well, there's broad agreement, and it's interesting now, it's not just here at home, it's in the European Union and uh, the UK, I hate to see that as a separate statement, um, and not just here, but in other developing parts of the world, in China, in Japan, in California, all the technological centers are agreeing, yeah, this is going to be one of the big areas of decarbonization. And in our part of Europe, the German government, French government, Belgian, Dutch, Norwegian, Danes, all committed, and UK, all committed to the development of offshore wind. And we've been talking about this for 10 years and thinking about it for 10 years. And in that 10 years, we've learned a lot. So it's, we're, we're not starting from scratch. 
Um, we've learned that it's becoming more competitive and is likely to continue to come down in price. So this is going to be good for our economy. We can do this in a way that taps into that comparative competitive advantage. And we are starting to, people are already starting to build it out at scale. Ireland hasn't. We, only, we, we were first out of the blocks in the Arclo Bank with those uh, six or seven turbines, is it? Um, uh, General Electric turbines built by electricity. Um, we probably rightly went, concentrated then on onshore because it was more competitive for our, country, our economy, but now it's the time for us to go offshore. We will start that firstly critically with the Marine Planning Development Bill, which will be introduced by the government early in the new year. It's critical that you get the planning right. This is a huge capital investment. The more you can de-risk it in terms of de-risk the uncertainty, uh, getting the planning right, living up to environmental standards to the max, maintaining uh, public support on environmental issues and on the planning of it. But the more we can get that right, the lower the cost, the easier it is for people to know, yeah, this is a, a predictable investment. Um, we will then at the end of next year, start the first auctions, first a series of auctions to start deploying the large scale wind offshore at scale. Starting with roughly about two and a half gigawatts in the Irish Sea, starting with existing projects, which have already been in the planning system for our licensing system in a variety of ways over the last 10 years, starting with short direct connections back into the onshore Irish grid, starting the Irish Sea close to Dublin where there's significant demand uh, uh, and start in a way that gives us the platform to go on from there do a second auction shortly after that with further developments in the Irish Sea and also then a third auction and within those two starting to open up the, our southern waters, Celtic Sea. And then start looking at, and this decade, start looking at the development of floating offshore wind turbines um, as part of this process and really starting thinking about the scale uh, that we're going to deliver in that regard. Um, there are various other components we need to get right. We need to get our ports system right. And again, I remember I, Brendan was appointed, I appointed him to the chair of the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. In that 10, 12 years ago, he was frantically looking at where do we, which ports do we develop? How do we do the, how do we get the supply chain benefits from this? We still need to do that. And we will do that in the next year or two. Uh, and look uh, at a variety of different port options to be able to provide the operation and maintenance, the deployment, the supply chain, and also then down the line, the production, and also the collection of the power resource. The real issue when we get to 35 gigawatts is what do we do with that power? How do we ship it? How do we store it? How do we use it? Um, so those ports, the light, and it's likely our deep sea ports with access to the west, northwest, southwest, south and east, um, will then have the potential be for the location points where we bring that power back ashore. Whether that's in the form of electricity that then has to be transmitted, whether it's in the form of hydrogen or uh, some such storage system, that has to be worked out. We're not the only ones looking at this. Everyone else is considering this as the new industrial development question of our time. We can and will be good at this. And it will create employment and create opportunities for us uh, to create employment in a balanced way, given that the power is coming in from the West and the Northwest and Southwest, that will further enhance the industrial development in my mind in those areas, rather than concentrate all the industrial development which is happening increasingly on the East Coast at this present time. One other point about this, um, for it to work at that scale of power, and if we were able to deliver 35 gigawatts, given that our sea areas are 10 times our land, our land area, why would we stop there? If this works, if it is central to this new industrial clean energy digital revolution that's taking place, we have the prospect we could build even further. But to do that, we will have to be able to ship it as well to other countries. We will have to be part in my mind of an interconnected network. Have to, no matter what Brexit brings, maintain cooperation with the UK so that in this whole area, whether it's sharing hydrogen, CCS facilities, or electricity power through high voltage direct cable connections, we cooperate. 
think it's really significant at the moment we're building a new, even in these very harsh Brexit times, we're likely to see a new interconnector between the Wexford coast and North Wales. And critically that we're also building a new interconnector with, between ourselves and France. And I see that, and Brendan used to think this way, thinking that is only the start of something which is going to be really big, which is this super grid that ships solar power from the south, Scandinavian and Alpine hydro and wind from the northwest of Europe and other power supply sources into a balancing system between variable power and variable demand across this wider area. It's the most critical peace project of our time. It allows us the prospect of actually sharing energy in a different way, of distributing energy ownership and energy power across an area so that the resource wars and the challenges we've seen in the outgoing century are not repeated in this 21st century. And same time we meet the climate challenge of our day. That sounds big, but that is where we are going and where we need to think of, which Brendan would have inspired me to do. Can I bring it down more local? Because yes, we need to think on that big scale, but we also need to think very locally about using the power. How do we use it in our own homes, in our own area? One of the things we've learned in the last 10 years in the IIEA sessions as much as anywhere else is that it's not just the engineering, it's not just the technology, it's not just the economics, it's not just the grids and the power relations between states. It's about how we inspire our citizens that this is actually going to be their transition their transformation, good for them. I think this is possible. I think the ESB get it in their strategy. Pat, you talk about it, it's this transformation of using electricity for everything and being really bringing it down to the local level, is, which is what you do well and will do well in the next 30, 40 years serving our people. It is about electrifying the heat in our homes, transforming building both efficiency, which Owen Lewis would, is, has the expertise on, with this clean power supply, so that we take out the oil and gas fired burners as quick as we can and replace them with heat pumps and really well insulated buildings. And the benefit of that is so many fold. Firstly, to our health. Anyone who comes down in one of these cold winter mornings into a warm home will know that's a completely different experience where you can stay in your pajamas and the house is healthy and warm. It's a fundamental transformation, improvement of our everyday lives. It's also really efficient. Those heat pumps deliver an efficiency gain that means actually they're a better energy system. They work better than the outgoing model and that has to be the case. It has to be a better energy system for it to work. And it gives us the balancing capability. It gives us the use of that power, which is a really clever use of it because we can turn it on and off as we need to, to match the variable power supply as it varies with the wind coming and going, as well as having that interconnection to give us further balancing capability. Secondly, we're going to use that electricity power to power how we move around. Obviously with electric vehicles, that's coming now with the real certainty because they're just better vehicles. Fifth of the fuel costs, fifth of the maintenance costs, a, hundred, a tenth at least of the moving parts so that they're just better cars, better to drive, cleaner local air, better for our health that way. Um, so we know that's coming. That'll only be the start. Really interesting talking to Irish Rail at the moment. We have an interesting uh, strategic decision coming up in the next six months where they will have to commission new trains, buying new trains, the first new electric battery chain, trains that we can use on our suburban rail services. That's our Cork suburban rail service, our Limerick suburban rail service, our Galway suburban rail service, our Waterford suburban rail service, as well as our Dublin suburban rail service run on electric batteries where you get into the station in Mallow, you charge up, you get back to Middleton, going through the eight stations along the way. And we have our trains there in Shannon Airport, fully charged, heading via Moy Ross on towards Foyne, stopping off from Patrick's Well, Crescent, Dura Doyle, all those stations en route along the way. So electrified transport in this efficient way where we do what's called transport-led development, really efficient de design of communities around really effective, efficient public transport system run on electricity power. Lastly, going back to what I was saying there about these ports of the potential then for the development of our industrial uh, use. Our, what we have to do in 100% decarbonization is switch everything. Um, so that means all those cement plants, all these smelting plants, all the big food processing plants, all uh, currently fueled by fossil, are gonna to have to be fueled by electricity or hydrogen or have CCS instead. 
and this is doable, this is going to be a better system because we're not relying on long distance supply chains. We'll have the local power supply available to us here. It'll be cleaner and it's where the world is going. And it creates that distributed industrial model where the industries close to the power supply have the advantage. So it balances, changes Ireland in every way for the better. Lastly, and go back to what I was saying to you, Pat, about that ESB role on the distribution system. You know, and I know, we all know that the, actually one of the biggest challenges in this is if we have a row of houses in South Dublin, let's say Bernard's or Brendan Halligan's home area of Rathfarnham, we have a whole series of those semi D suburban Irish houses we all, well, we didn't all grow up in, I grew up in. Um, how do we get electricity to each of those houses, each running a heat pump, each running an electric vehicle in the front drive and make it work? You know that that's probably one of the biggest challenges of our time. It will be done by really clever use of data management systems so things switch on and off so that, that the wire limit right down at the end is used in a really hyper efficient way. It'll be done where as a street or as a community, as a neighborhood or as a parish, we actually cooperate. We actually, to get that management of the energy at the local level, the really balancing of it, where I'm allowing my deep fridge to be turned on and off or my electric vehicle charger to be turned on and off or my heat pump to be turned on and off so that my neighborhood, my street is part of an overall balancing system. That's, I think, how we're gonna do it. To do that, we need trust. To do that, we need this to be a social transformation. Uh, Brenton came from a Labour social democratic justice tradition. This transformation has to deliver that. It has to be Pollyanna's great transformation, market serving people, public service serving our people, all towards their betterment, towards their owning the data in those sharing systems so that they have confidence, well, this is mine. This is my transformation. This is my advantage. This is my home heated where we are playing our part in the greatest challenge of our time, stopping the burning of our planet, res restoring biodiversity, and at the same time, maintaining our jobs, maintaining our economy, maintaining our welfare. It is a social democratic green transformation. That's what Brendan espoused, and I share it with him. Um, and I think most Irish, all Irish political parties are bought into this now. This is where we're gonna go. That analysis that Jack Delors had 20 years ago, that with the Irish, when they set their minds on a common goal, when as a relatively small country where people get to know each other and talk to each other, set themselves in the task of delivering it, when you meet in the likes of the IAEA, where you can swap notes in an informal way and actually get the synergies and the, the benefits of having this connected island we have, that's what we're going to do. And it's going to be four, five, six governments time, but four, five, six governments doing the same thing in this path will bring us there and it will serve our people well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. Perhaps a, a special word of thanks um, for your remarks about Brendan. I mean, that idea that um, he has missed, I, I certainly missed the late night exchange of emails about emerging ideas in offshore energy, for instance. Um, but um, we have a, a big number of um, questions. So maybe I'll pa turn immediately to those. And the first question I have before me is from Alan Dukes, former Director General of the IIEA and former Minister for Finance. And he asks, uh, we use vast quantities of precious metals, plastic and steel in making over elaborate cars and mobile communication devices and consumer product packaging that we have because we can, not because we really need them. This process use huge, uses huge amounts of energy. Is there any prospect of serious measures to reduce this climate wrecking profligacy, Minister? Yeah, uh, there is. Um, the, 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 the transformation won't just be in the energy side. It has to be in the land use agricultural side. It has to be in the transport and it has to be in every area, but it will also has to be materials use. Um, I come from the training of the late early 70s uh, systems analysis that limits to growth. Daniel Meadows and uh, Daniel, Daniela Meadows and others devised to say that the challenge for this 21st century is how do we balance the um, various objectives of maintaining economic 
well-being while maintaining environmental environmental limits. Um, and their systems not modeling showed that actually it was going to be really difficult and and I think particularly on resource use. So what we need as well as this energy transformation is the development of a circular economy, um, which radically reduces the level of material use and uh, um, consumption. Um, I believe it is possible and I think the, again, it will be delivered because it will be a better economy. Um, within government, um, inheriting good work done by Richard Bruton and others, we have just published a, circular, a waste action plan for a circular economy. It has about 200 actions in it. Um, and I believe it's setting us in the right path. Um, and going back to it, maybe I can be because or your man's a bit optimistic or a bit kind of um, positive sometimes about our country or about our ability, because we have failings too, Lord knows, our emissions record is sh shocking. Um, but the industry sat down with the department in the last year and the environmental NGOs and social organizations and they agreed to this plan, this waste action plan. And it is quite radical and, and quite progressive, very progressive. Um, I was out last week and one of our big recycling companies, Panda, they just said, okay, we're gonna go electric vehicles for their collection trucks. We're gonna invest in a new um, bottle recycling facility. So all those plastic bottles, the curse of anyone who does a beach cleanup or a river cleanup will, be able to be recycled here rather than exported to China and or to Rotterdam and will be able to turn that plastic pet bottle back into a bottle that's used again by Coca-Cola or some other such company and that's only one of 200 actions but it's starting to be delivered and I think the real I keep going back to my fundamental message I suppose that I think that I learned in that conversation with Brendan about the European Commission assessment of Ireland is when we pool together, it works. And if, can I say the best example of that probably is Alan Jukes. I mean, that's the Tala strategy. That's what happened, got us out of the economic crisis in the late eighties. It wasn't just Alan Jukes, it was like Rory O'Donnell and others who, who recognized that it was a time not for division. It was a time for working together, for collaborating on economic strategy out of that shockingly bad crisis. And it worked. And I would say, the 2010-11 experience, my experience in that time in government, one of the reasons why we were able to get out of that bloody horrible difficult crisis, and it wasn't easy getting out of it, was because there was a handover from Brian Lennon to, um, to the incoming government, the incoming Minister of Finance, and, and a cont continuity. And therefore I keep going back, the lessons to me seems to be in this modern world, how you manage good economic recoveries, is you try it by consensus. It's a good day today. We hopefully we'll have to see how the unions vote for it, but we may just have agreed a partnership, uh, a pay agreement for the next couple of years. It'd be up to the unions to decide how they vote in it. But that's what we're good at. We're good at a partnership. We're good at social partnership. We're good at collaboration, and we do that for the circular economy as well as everything else. Thanks, Minister. Um, may I put a question to you, uh, Pat O'Doherty? Um, it's from Dunha Kavanagh, and um, he inquire he says the the ESB's remit still is still to meet the country's energy uh, electricity requirements but to what extent can this be achieved by reducing energy demand rather than by producing and selling more electricity you're on mute yeah sorry yep back yep yes, thanks thanks on so he, he, I suppose he, he, the question I asked is he, ESB's remit of course ESB's remit now uh, we operate in different parts of the value chain, very different remit to the one we had 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, so our generation, our retail businesses operate in competitive markets and our networks business then is the monopoly business is regulated and the networks businesses, uh, as the minister said, networks into the future have a key enabling role in terms of um, leading, leading the transition. But I suppose in terms of uh, to the extent to which the future energy requirements can be met uh, by energy efficiency reduction, like uh, this goes back to you know the EU mantra and all of this is efficiency first, decarbonisation and then electrification. Um, so everything we're doing in ESB is to make the system more efficient, uh, whether that's in our generation business, uh, whether that's in our networks business in the context of of of, of, of our license obligations in accordance with, and in accordance with the, our price controls. 
Uh, and likewise, also in, in, in our interaction with customers for our retail business, efficiency should be, must be, and should be high up on the agenda. So efficiency first. So the EU mantra is effectively our mantra also. Thank you, Pat. Um, uh, Minister, um, to turn to electric vehicles for a moment, uh, Derek Riley of the uh, EV Review Ireland YouTube channel asks, do you think that Ireland will be able to match other European um, uh, member states such as Germany and France with their generous grants for purchasing new EVs? And he also notes that Scotland provides interest-free loans to purchase second-hand EVs. Minister. We do, and I, I'm very fortunate to have the role as Minister for Transport as well as Minister for uh, Environment, Climate and, and Communications here, and, and I think there's real crossover and synergy. Um, electric vehicles are going to be a key part to this transition. Um, they, they bring huge benefits. It will not be, the transport system though won't work if it's just we think, oh, we're gonna switch from combustion engine vehicles to electric vehicles. It has to think bigger, I think, somewhat in tor towards us monitoring to, to have to drive less. Uh, this will come because what COVID has brought is, is remote working now that we never expected to deliver it this fast at this scale. It will, I think the standard office will probably run on a hybrid system where maybe it's three days a week rather than five days a week from the office. And, and that will reduce the amount of electricity of demand for travel. But similarly, if, if we're to live up to the national planning framework, we will we will reduce the amount of long distance commuting. It's not serving our people to have this dispersed transport model, but we will still have cars and particularly cars first in rural Ireland. I think for rural Ireland this year, where we, because of that technical issue I mentioned around the challenge of how you do a terraced row of houses, each with an EV, that's a real challenge. It's gonna take us a bit of time to work out. That doesn't apply in rural Ireland. Rural Ireland, one off house in the country, it's very easy to get the car recharged. Um, we will have a whole range of other policy measures. We've just introduced significant changes in the budget on the tax uh, of vehicles, again, for other tax, which will incentivize electric vehicles. We've maintained or continued the grant supports for electric vehicles and for the charging infrastructure in people's home. We will continue to look at a whole range of other measures to make sure it works. I think one of the other key things that I was pointing out though, what is one of the key things we need to get right it is the public charging infrastructure. Uh, it is, I mean, for most people, they're probably, you know, particularly rural Ireland, it'll be charged at home and that'll be fine. But there'll be some people who, who will need charging infrastructure on interurban motorways, who will need charging infrastructure in their local area, particularly if they can't put a charger straight outside their home. Um, we gave an upfront payment or investment from the Climate Fund, Richard Bruton did, for ESB to work with the... Uh, very, to, to upgrade our charging infrastructure. And we were one of the first countries out with the charging infrastructure. I would have to say, because that government I was involved in 10 years ago really put us right up ahead of the, ahead of the pack. But I, I fear that we've fallen behind in what we need to be, and we need to accelerate the rollout of public charging infrastructure. And I think we have to do that ahead of the really large volume of cars, cars coming in two or three or four years time. I mean, really scale delivery. And the difficulty is for those uh, petrol stations and other potential uh, sites for charging infrastructure that they're saying, well, I don't have the demand yet. I met them recently, met the industry and said, we're going to have to invest. We're going to have to invest ahead of demand. We're going to have to invest at scale so that when you go into, let's say, an interurban motorway along the network, uh, there's 10, 12, 15, 20 charging points, not just two or three. And that's difficult because, again, you've got to get the electricity to that point, and that's a challenge. Um, but if we don't put it there, we're going to have to build somewhere else to put it because we're going to need the infrastructure. And if in the urban areas we don't have it in our petrol stations and so on, well, then we'll have to look at supermarkets or car parks or other potential locations, and we'll have to act fast because these cars are coming at scale, at number, and we'll need powering. And in some locations, we won't be able to do it at home, so we'll have to have alternatives. And... Um, so yes, I think that's the key thing I think we need to get right. The last thing I'd say, just go back to about not fixating on ownership. One of the solutions here is towards in a changing, it's going to be e-mobility in a whole variety of different ways. Electric bikes are going to have a huge part of this transition, e-scooters. 
and e-sharing, car sharing, car, um, a whole range of different, I won't go into the even variety of them now, but it, it does need to change away from just everyone has their car and everyone, you know, it is, we should use this opportunity of change to, to make it more efficient and more better value because most of our cars are parked for 95% of the time. If we can get access to a shared car and we only pay, let's say a fraction of what we're currently paying, what's not to like about that? Thank you. Um, the implications for our cities and towns of reducing the number of vehicles, um, the, the real estate which is tied up in, in parking uh, and so on, all of those kind of multiple uh, co-benefits of these kind of changes, Minister, are very impressive. But let me turn to a, an area um, to do with the gas network where several uh, people, including David Kelly and Catherine Sheridan of Ervia and uh, Porrick Hoare of the Irish Examiner are asking, um, ref refers to the recent announcement by uh, Airgrid that the record uh, peak, peak demand for electricity has been uh, twice exceeded uh, in the past week. The European Green Deal proposes to address uh, this challenge with energy system integration. Uh, to this end, what policy changes does the minister want to prioritize for the decarbonization of the gas network? Good question. Can I just say first of all that, and it relates back to the question you asked about Pat earlier on around efficiency. Like we can and we are, are good at this, Yes, we've just gone over the kind of reach a new peak. It was 5,200 megawatts of recent Thursday evening. Or, or, well, actually, that's similar to the level of power use we, we, uh, we were at 10, 12 years ago. So, and our economy has significantly expanded since then. So that shows it is possible to get efficiency, to get, and efficiency does come first. Um, so, um, so this big, so that it isn't impossible for us to really, and that's before we start being really efficient in our public lighting, in our public buildings, in our whole, in our industry, in a whole range of different other ways. The gas infrastructure will have a role in this transition. I'll be honest. Uh, I'm very nervous that, particularly in Europe, we're kind of uh, that can be oversold and. People are putting out all sorts of solutions, you know, gas, uh, blue hydrogen and other solutions. And, and I think the scale of the climate crisis is such is that we are looking at a very radical shift away from fossil fuels, all fossil fuels and gas, while it has a role in the security role and, and a critical role currently in our heating systems. You know, we, we need all our warm homes, but we are we're moving away from fossil fuels and there will be end use applications for gas, obviously, it, particularly it, with CCS uh, as a possibility. And it seems that that what has been talked about for several decades is starting now to come into view as a, as a where other states are significantly saying they're going, to, they're going to really try and scale it up and see whether it can be economic. And that if that was the case, it may provide potential up, uh, uses uh, of gas. Um, but there are others, uh, I suppose, very strongly argued that we have, we can look at biomethane as they are develop gas from natural resources. I'll be honest on that as well. I think the scale of power supplies that we can gas supplies we can get from that is limited. It would be very welcome, particularly in tackling waste uh, in um, our, our waste our, our um, sewage systems, our uh, landfill system, whether we can catch capture. Uh, and also other waste uh, sources for uh, biomethane would be a critical uh, benefit and uh, an area we will need to invest in, including anaerobic di digestion. But I think there's a limited potential at the scale of that because as well as us facing a climate crisis, we're facing a biodiversity crisis. And, and it's critical we address the two at the same time and provide natural um, solutions that improve the natural world to the climate crisis. If we were to really double down on the development of biogenic methane from anaerobic digestion, which involved a large increase in the amount of slurry from pig, poultry, or cattle production, um, and that would have consequences in terms of water quality, in terms of ammonia, air quality problems, and just an industrial type agricultural system that would be bad for the environment, bad for biodiversity. So 
Yes, we will use anaerobic digestion. Yes, we will have the, the role of biogas will be, will be significant, particularly from waste resources, but it will be in probably very efficient, in my mind, precise applications, combined heat and power and food processing and other areas. It won't be just we replace one gas system with another, unless there's some technological change coming that I'm not aware of yet. Um, but it is, it has to be a just transition. We have to do this in the same way we've been trying to manage uh, board pneumonia where, where it has uh, been really, where the company's turned around, where they've gone, as they say, from brown to green, uh, that they've now become a climate solutions company and we're seeing employment and investment rise. I, I think similarly for, for the real skills we have in, the, in the, our, our gas network and uh, energy companies and in, and in gas fired power stations, there's huge skill there that skill will be applied in, in climate solutions and, and those companies will have a real significant role in the, in, in the transition. Um, it's just we have to be careful that it's not on the false promise that we can continue either on gas to hydrogen or gas used in, in a way that triggers other environmental difficulties. Thank you, Minister. I have a, um, a question from Michael O'Mahon, which, which is uh, related and he is addressing both yourself and Pat O'Doherty. He asks, when renewable energy, uh, well, uh, wind energy generation is high, the electricity price will be low, zero, or possibly even negative. Which is better for Ireland, to export renewable electricity at low prices or produce green hydrogen and export a higher value product, creating many more Irish jobs? Pat, would you like to lead off on that, please? Uh, yes, I, I, I suppose the, the, the issue there really is the economics of hydrogen production uh, and hydrogen transport. And that's that's currently being debated right across Europe. So, for example, is it do, do you cite hydrogen production close to industries which are hard to electrify and therefore you're able to decarbonize uh, th those industries indirectly? Or do you uh, do you cite hydrogen production close to where there's an abundance of, of, of renewable wind, of renewable energy such as wind in excess, and, and then pr produce the hydrogen and transport it. And I suppose that debate is still going to run and run, and that all depends on, on the economics. And, you know, some, some really big thinkers such as, say, Michael Lienbrecht, Lienbrecht of Bloomberg New Energy Finance is questioning whether hydrogen um, produced from curtailed wind is economic against producing hydrogen close to the centers of demand for hydrogen. I suppose that all depends on how the technology evolves, but there is no doubt that hydrogen, uh, like at the heart of this question also is the role of hydrogen into the future. And there are some other questions there around integration and sector coupling between gas and electricity. And hydrogen will be at the heart of that. And it is important in that regard that hydrogen, that Ireland does have regard to hydrogen and has a strategy and a roadmap for hydrogen. Thanks, Pat. Uh, Minister? Yeah, one of the things you learn over time being involved in energy policy, and I have been over time now, is sometimes you get caught out. Things don't happen. You know, technologies don't evolve in the way you thought they would, or but a lot do. But but um, we've a certain amount of things that are still uh, uncertain. Um, floating wind. First of all, we have to make sure floating wind works at scale uh, for this all to become a viable reality because. Uh, that's where the scale volume of, of energy capable production. Now, the odds, to be honest, on that are, are incredibly high now because um, it's already tested technology. Um, the, everyone's investing in it at scale. I, I, we, we've seen with wind and solar, onshore wind and, and solar, that the cost curve has come down and, and we've every reason to expect the same and not floating offshore wind. But it does need, we do need just to be careful that we do need to 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 really see how we develop that at scale. And, and I'm absolutely confident we will. So it's right to us to invest on the on the expectation, particularly for our state where we have this comparative competitive advantage. I would say the same in terms of hydrogen, but probably a bigger higher level of uncertainty, yes, as to what the exact uh, approach deployment is going to be. Um, and this is where the engineers have to step in and, and really help us. It, it's, uh, it's energy systems uh, engineering that uh, is, is needed. Um, but I think, well, again, we're, we're fairly clear that with the scale of investment that I see other governments starting to make, that, that is, it is going to be the, one of the, a key part of this energy future. My instinct is um, 
that it may well, come back to what I was saying in my own contribution at the start, that actually for our deep water ports in particular, which are close to the access to the power supply, just to go back to what Pat was saying, you know, the question, as Michael Liebrich was indicating, that, that you might have a generator close to the, the point of consumption, that might give us the capability in some of those locations to actually feed the hydrogen directly into into industrial applications where it could uh, where it could be a very efficient use of it and, and less transition or, or uh, uh, less tran transformation costs involved in, in the whole process. So so I think one of the and that's why I keep going back to saying this may have an economic development application for the whole island, not just the energy sector, but the industrial processing side. And actually, if you look at a lot of our big industrial systems already in, and we don't have many, but uh, are, in, are already in the likes of Shannon Estuary, or um, Cork um, Harbour, and, and, and their sort of deep water locations, you would have thought, would have uh, real comparative advantages in, uh, in bringing in, in hydrogen, which means, which means we won't need LNG in those facilities. Um, Minister, um, I, if I can bundle a couple of questions together which are raising a similar issue, um, Ona Hearn of Kodima and uh, Gary Fitzpatrick are both asking about uh, nuclear energy and specifically small modular nuclear reactors. Are, are these something that uh, could be on the government's agenda? Is it any more worth exploring? I've always said I wouldn't rule out if if someone could show that there is new form of nuclear power that that is uh, fits in within this model but but I'll be honest I don't I mean I see some things on design boards or, or drawing boards but nothing in, in application and no real scale of investment or you come back to what I was saying there about Europe betting everything on hydrogen or, or big industrial company I mean yes there's still obviously nuclear applications in France and elsewhere but there's no one coming to my desk or my door saying we're looking to put in nuclear anything anywhere. Um, there, I don't get a sense from my colleagues um, um, across the European Union or indeed when I'm dealing a big discussion with Californian authorities recently or other, they don't, that's not what, it, what people are, are investing in. If there was a modular um, form of nuclear, it would obviously fit in better to this variable supply and demand balancing uh, energy system, big, large nuclear will find it very difficult to operate in this new energy markets or electricity markets, but, but I wouldn't rule it out, but, but I don't see it um, coming across my desk. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Alice Coffey at Cambridge University. Um, she asks, in relation to Ireland's economic policy, to what extent is decarbonisation compatible with growth in GDP. Do you think that absolute decoupling of GDP grow, uh, growth from resource use and carbon emissions is feasible? I do. John Fitzgerald is writing in the Irish Times today about our GDP figures are shot with uncertainties and inaccuracies. So if you're relying on GDP growth for anything, for an assessment of where we are, you'd be, you'd be puzzled. Um, the economic plan we'll develop is, is green and digital, as in the European plan, as is the UK plan, in truth. Um, the, but it also has another twist to it, I think, in, agreed, in our agreement, that it was recognised that GDP does not give you a, a very good accurate measure of well-being, and, and, a whole, and there's a whole range of other indicators we need, now need to, to uh, develop. Um, I'd be an advocate of Kate Rayworth's donut economics and that kind of the social measures of progress as well as uh, environmental ones being the key parameters of, of progress. Um, and it was interesting, I think I saw her writing an article or citing an article recently, which says that this kind of divide supposedly between degrowth or, or you know, various different uh, sides of the envir environmental economic side isn't necessarily as deep a division as some people think, and, and uh, but uh, I would come from that fairly deep green sense of it's about quality of life, not quantity of consumption. And the sooner we start measuring every pro progress on quality of life, and it includes less consumption, the better. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Richard Morrison, which is addressed uh, to both of you. Um, um, he asks, are there any awareness initiatives planned to get the three and a half million people who are not on this uh, very informative call 
uh, onto this uh, transformative journey. Pat, maybe you'd like to lead off on how... Uh, I, I, I know this is a subject... I know this is a subject that's uh, very close to the minister's heart, and he's put and he he, he demands of us in the energy sector that we uh, we communicate and engage with the citizen with citizens uh, to to travel this this journey. And this journey is a, is a difficult journey because, as I said in my opening, uh, people have to make choices about how they live their lives, about how they drive, what cars they drive, how they heat their homes, and these are all difficult and expensive choices. Uh, and there is a role for us in the energy sector uh, to to work with uh, with citizen groups, with commun customer and community groups, uh, to do to do that. Uh, it's it, and, and that is that is a real challenge uh, because ultimately it's the customer that has to come to the table here to make all of this work. Working back from the utility and from the engineering piece out, that brings one piece, but ultimately. It's, it, it's, it, it's, it's developing products and services and landing products and services that customers and consumers find are useful for them in their everyday lives and, and, and you know, convincing and engaging and selling the message that this is about quality of life and quality of living as opposed to just kilowatt hours buying and selling kilowatt hours. It's a real challenge and it's something that all of the electricity companies in the electricity sector are putting their minds to and it's something that the minister as I said is demanding of us that we do. Minister. Yeah we did a lot of work um, in a series of climate gatherings where we where we really thought the question is how do we tell the story so that it, it really inspires our people because it, it won't come from top down just I mean you you do need top down signals and uh, supports and make it easier for people to do the right thing um, and not just putting it all on the consumer responsibility, the environmental movement have learned to change their tack in recent years to putting it all on you are the one who have to change. But but having said that, we know to change our agriculture, there's 120,000 farms and that's not easy to, to change. And we know that, you know, those one and a half million homes that we have to build better, retrofit and, and so on, that's an, every home is an individual home decision. Um, in, in how we do that, the things we learned around the messaging is, well, firstly, you listen. You ask for help rather than telling people what to do. You admit some of the uncertainties I mentioned earlier on around you know, how technology evolves. You have to have the patience of those who built the cathedrals in Europe. It'll take several decades for us to deliver. Um, you speak to the home, about the home. You not just speak about big planetary issues, but you bring it back down to local community, local environment, local the home um, and family. and, and close to people. Um, but going back to my message, I suppose, earlier on, it has to be a better economy. If you're stopping going from A to one sustainable B, you have to have a better alternative C. It has to be better. So those 120,000 farmers have to know that actually they're going to get paid better. All of them, the, particularly the ones that are paid so badly at the moment. Um, those one and a half million homes, they we have to make sure that we can do it under a loan arrangement that it is actually that the bills are paid for with the savings and uh, and make that real uh, as a better better economic investment. Um, but lastly, um, yeah, it has to be citizen centered. It has, and it's it's all doable in this country. Last week, they, or this week, the GA just started their green clubs initiative, where they're going to get that clubs looking at their own local environment, loan loan local use of energy, local transport systems, and so on. Irish people are ready for this. Irish people are going to be really good at this. It's going to be good for Irish people. We're, we're right up for it, I think. But we will get it collectively is with a bit of humility and a bit of uh, listening rather than telling people what to do, as I said, and, and asking for help. And I suspect addressing things in ways that are a little more than, you know, the benefit cost analysis and stuff like that, but more, uh, you, you mentioned both in transport and the home, that a better quality uh, results as well as a, a more comfortable home and so on, Minister. Um, it, it's getting very close. I, I might just squeeze in one last question, which actually was addressed to both of you, but uh, maybe Pat, you might briefly address. It's it's about, um, it's from Neil Ryan, and he asks, I note that coal is currently making up about 7.5% of our energy production today. In greening our energy sector, will the closure of fossil fuel be based on their economic viability or the amount of CO2 they produce? Um, 
So, yeah, so co- co- given, I suppose, the level of high demand uh, today and during the winter, coal, coal will be to be higher levels of coal produced. But for many parts of this year, there was, there was no electricity produced from coal. Um, but, but ultimately, so coal for, for Ireland and for ESP is money point. Um, and I, you know, where, you know e, the e- economics and carbon are, 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 are the one thing. The, the ETS, the Emissions Trading Scheme, puts an economic price on carbon. Um, and coal, like it's end game for coal. Um, anybody in the market knows that Money Point coal plants have not secured capacity contracts for the year 2025. So that's bringing, you know, that's bringing the, um, the cessation of coal ever, ever closer. Um, coal does provide a, a security of supply component uh, to, uh, for, for sure. And that all has to be addressed. But, but like in, in, in the coming years, Coal will, will will become an ever decreasing uh, component of electricity generation, and eventually, not we can see a point in time very very close when we will cease producing electricity on coal. Thank you, Minister. Do you want just a, a brief concluding mark on on that on that one, please? We have, we have, we have to stop burning everything, <laughs> and we have to. Um, and we have to switch to a better alternative. And this is viable. It'll be challenging. It'll be connected with our neighbours. The balancing, when we're, so rather than relying, relying on big base load here, we will have interconnection. And, and some of that will be nuclear coming in with France or the UK. Um, but it is, go back to the really big picture. I think these new cables, HVDC cables, that size could take the power of money point. Will, the, the French interconnector will be the equivalent of money point in scale. And um, it can ship over, seven, eight hundred kilometers with next to no losses. And this is the transformation. It is, and it is collaborative. The nature of this digital green energy and transport revolution is more, it's a sharing economy. It's, it's balancing by sharing. And, um, and, and both right down to the house level, and we won't be burning coal at home um, very soon, stopping it entirely. And, and at the bigger baseload generation side. And have, uh, yes, we'll have some sort of security systems backing it up so that if, if the network fails, I'll be turned to Pat and say, quick, give me, a, give me a security, but it's just there as a security backup. The everyday system is going to be this balancing, flowing, efficiency first, digital low carbon system. That's the energy future ahead of us. And it is going to be socially just and citizen centered to make it work best in my mind. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you, Pat O'Doherty. Um, I fear I have trespassed slightly oh, two minutes over my scheduled time, so I will have to suppress the uh, um, gratitude, uh, except to put it very, very simply. And thank you uh, both, Minister, very particularly. Thank you for um, giving us a, a, a view, a perspective on the very substantial opportunities that lie before us in the in the coming years this was the final event in the 2020 uh, rethink energy series over the last months this series has explored a wide range of themes including the smart grid revolution the impacts of brevet and uh, brexit and covid 19 on the energy sector the prospects of an international price on carbon the challenges and opportunities regarding popular support for this energy transition and the prospects of deep water offshore wind energy. Um, I want to thank the ESB for their support in facilitating this lecture, this year's lecture series. And I want to thank all of our speakers, including you, Minister Eamon Ryan, for sharing their valuable insights with us. And finally, I'd like to thank our audience for your extensive engagement throughout the series. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. There were a mountain of questions. Thank you all very much and good day.